couple things about my story before I get started. Uh, as I go through this presentation, I'll, I'll say we because I did these while I was part of the Palm Beach Zoo team. And I do want to give a special thanks to the Palm Beach Zoo for allowing me to continue to talk about this after I've left. Uh, this, this platform, this topic is something that I'm very passionate about and the, the fact that they still allow me to con continue to use their story is very important for this topic to, to keep this safety moving forward. So briefly what we'll go over, what I'm going to go over today, um, and I'm really interested to see uh, Tracy and Jeff's talks as well, um, you know, why are we talking about this? And uh, you know, it's been it's been two years. We're still talking about it. I'm going to go a little bit over what exactly are the definitions of OSHA controls, which I think will help um, with all three of the presentations. And then I will go over the two key system with a two keeper rule, which is the method that Palm Beach Zoo used to implement the two key system. And then I'll talk about the supporting administrative controls that uh, that are needed to back up the engineering control and then a little bit about the cost of implementation. So, so first, um, you know, in the safety committee, we talk a lot about the statistics and the statistics really back up why we're doing this, why we're so passionate about this. <coughs> the three people that you see on the screen, they're real people. I wanted to put some faces with the statistics. I know these three stories well. I've been to these zoos. I've talked to the people <coughs> that were left afterwards. They were all experienced keepers. Um, Rosa King is not an AZA institution, but their protocols so closely match what many of the zoos have in this country. Their facility is really built well, safe, and just like the, the others, if protocols, the administrative controls had been followed, the accident wouldn't have happened. Um, and they are all three very passionate in the field very passionate about their animals and very experienced keepers and, and these are the faces of the kind of people that we're losing that we can prevent. <clears throat> so the common thread and this is the this is what what strikes me when you see a lot of these stories the common thread is not that it was a rookie keeper uh, they were blatantly and intentionally doing something wrong these are experienced keepers and Jan kind of referred to it a little bit maybe it's complacency they, they've done this a million times uh, we're all really well trained in our field of what we do for a living um, but I would guess that virtually every person in this room at least at one point has walked out the door and can't remember if they locked it when they left the house that day did you did I lock my car when I left it in the parking lot we all make these little mistakes and if you take care of some of these animals, it, it can turn deadly. And that's, that's our expectation of these keepers is that they, they're never gonna make a mistake. They're never gonna just have that moment where they weren't thinking. Uh, and so the engineering controls that we're talking about today, these can prevent that, that mistake, that accident, that complacency, it can stop it before it happens. So the hierarchy of controls. Um, anybody that's done any OSHA study, that you can see this pyramid upside down, backwards, sideways. Um, but the way OSHA looks at it, there are there's levels of controls, and the, the top two levels, the elimination and substitution, we really can't do unless all of our dangerous animals somehow become miraculously not endangered. We have a reason to have them. We have breeding programs. We have a reason to tell their story. So we're not gonna eliminate these animals from our collections because they are so important to our story. So the next best thing is the engineering controls. And the way OSHA wants people to approach this, not just uh, zoo people, but in industry, which is where most of their focus is, you start at the, the highest and work your way down. So the next most important thing we need to do is engineering controls, then administrative controls. So engineering controls, as it says on the diagram, it, it isolates people from the hazard and administrative controls change the way you work. It doesn't stop you from doing it, it changes your approach. And then the last, which is usually the low hanging fruit and the easiest that everybody goes to first is PPE. So that's, you know, it's happening. How can you protect yourself now that it's happening? So those are, that's the hierarchy. And that's why what we're gonna talk about today, a big focus on engineering controls 
with administrative com controls to sort it to support it. So very common key system. A lot of zoos have a, a variety of this. Anybody that saw my talk last year, this is a spin-off of the diagram, but um, I, visuals to me make a difference. What most zoos have is um, dangerous animal or deadly animal keepers, they have a key and it gets them into their animal space. It opens the feed chutes, it opens the door. Um, sometimes there's more than one key, and but there's a handful of people that have this key. They've been trained, they can all be here on the same day, and um, that can get them into that space. Even if the protocol says they're not allowed to, they have that key, they have that ability, they can open that door, they can enter that space. Um, and that's, that's what we need to change. So there's a lot going on on this slide. I'll, I'll talk you through it. Um, so implementing an engineering control is a two key system. So the really underlying piece of this is what you see here. You have two locks on a door, and this is a door that allows a keeper to enter the space that's normally occupied by the animal. It can be a nighthouse den. It can be the um, airlock. Okay. So two. The, the two separate locks, what that does is it not it makes it so that a single keeper on their own, and this is the point of the, the entire engineering control, is a keeper on their own cannot physically open both of those locks and enter that space. They have to have that second keeper. Um, in the term, you'll, you'll see it when it gets to the, the white paper and what, what some of the other press, it's at the, the <coughs> moment of inception. So the moment you're gonna open the door, two people have to be there. They don't have to be there the whole time, and that's what um, Tracy and Jeff will cover, different ways to do that. Uh, the method that Palm Beach Zoo chose, we chose to make it a two-keeper rule, which that, when you talk in the zoo industry, that can that's a big can of worms, whether it's two-keeper rule versus one-keeper rule. So we're all here to explain the fact that <clears throat> there are lots of ways to do this, and please don't confuse the two-key system with a two-keeper rule, because they are not connected. They, it's one method, and there's there's a lot of ways around this. Um, the the way that we implemented at Palm Beach the the third lock, um, which is shown in the the a visual of a padlock, but it can be the lock to the door to get into the building. It can be the feed chute. It can be the shift door. The third lock, either key can work for that, or what um, other zoos are doing. There's a second key on the ring that opens that if you don't have uh, the integral cores that have the ability to have a master and submaster set. So at Palm Beach, um, we were, uh, I was tasked by Andrew, our CEO at the time, to make this safe, but not cumbersome. So I worked with our locksmith to come up with the sub, what they called a submaster. So the yellow key or the red key, will either one will unlock that lock. So it doesn't matter which key you've got today, you can get in the building, you can make diets, you can even shift animals, you can open feed chutes, but when you get to this door, you can't open it. You can only open the red lock. You have to have that other person. Protocol says you had to have that person there for all that, but you can break that protocol. That's administrative control. The engineering control is here, it stops. And, and to go back to the statistics that the safety committees put together, all of the instances we have found where someone went in and got killed they were working by themselves. There's not a place where it was a two keeper rule and they went in and one or both of the keepers got killed. There's a lot of near miss stories out there about two keeper rules and the near misses and distractions, but the statistics back up the fact that when people get killed, it's when they're working by themselves and they unintentionally go into that space that the animal is in or has access to. So implementing the two key system, one of the most important things you have to have is you have to have a, a key control process. At Palm Beach, uh, it's a small zoo with uh, a reasonably small staff. And we don't have like a security guard that's always there or a receptionist that's always there that could be responsible for the keys. So we adopted um, the key watcher, which is an electronic key cabinet. Um, I am a big advocate for not only the electronic cabinets, but this particular one, it has a lot of safety features built in. Uh, it works off a fingerprint, 
which means you can't give somebody your ID or give somebody your code and have them grab your key for you. You physically have to go to the cabinet. We located the cabinet right next to the time clock, so they were already used to scan their thumbprint in to clock in, step two steps over, scan and get your keys. Um, the, the things that I liked about this over some of the other ones is the automatic reporting. It has some built-in safety features. We set a time uh, at six o'clock at the end of the day. Everybody should be done with their routine. If you haven't turned your keys back in, uh, the curators um, and I used to get a text message that says, hey, um, Jeff still has his keys out. That gave them the ability to call Jeff on the radio, hey, is everything okay? If everything's okay, you can give them an estimate when he's gonna be done. If they got done at five o'clock and hopped in their car and they were already home cooking dinner, they gotta turn around and bring their key back. Um, it was uh, not negotiable. You cannot keep the keys overnight. Uh, part of that stemmed from through the investigations that we went through, the key security was a big deal. Uh, Palm Beach had a, a policy where keepers, they were issued their keys, they're responsible for them. They took them home at night, they brought them back. and. Uh, we realized that was really uh, opening us up to see some security risks, so this kind of fixed both. I did put at the bottom, there are other options. You can have a designated person who distributes keys. During Hurricane Irma, we didn't have power for a week. Key cabinet lasts about 48 hours. So um, we pulled all the keys out, we turned them over to Jan, our general curator, and she issued keys in the morning and got them back at the end of the day. If you have that person already, or have a person that can be responsible for that, you don't have to spend the money on the cabinet. You can control that through a person. And then another method um, that you'll hear about is uh, you can do a method where the general staff that's doing the work has one of the keys and then a manager or a supervisor has the other key. They can have them all the time, but no one person ever has both. So um, the line level keepers, all one key, a supervisory level has the other key, and then you don't have to worry about that daily exchange if that's not a concern for you. And so, as I go through this, what I'm trying to build on the fact that there's a lot of flexibility within this, and you know, we're all here as a resource. If you decide you wanna go down this path and you just think it's not possible, just reach out to us because, I mean, we've all, all three of us have worked really close together uh, to get things implemented at their facilities and I'm, I'm starting down that road at Riverbanks now so um, it's going to be a, a, a fun process for me as well. So we had we had a concern of well if I'm in if I'm in this building and I need to get in there I don't have two keys I got I need to have a backup key um, and, but no one could give me an exact specific scenario of why do you need to take both of those locks off and go in that space what emergency brings you in there that's actually safe if it's because there's a person in there with the animal you need the emergency response team there you need a dart team you need firearms team. you need something else to back you up you're not going in there by yourself so we talked about you know having an emergency lockbox with an alarm and you know connected to the internet and all of this crazy stuff and um, Someone, I don't even remember who came up with the idea, well, why can't we just bolt cutters? Um, so Andrew, our CEO, he said, that's a great idea. We bought the bolt cutters with the longest handles possible, so even the smallest of keepers, they can snap a lock, because if you ever tried to use bolt cutters on a lock, they, they're made to not cut. So um, in every building that has this system, there's a set of bolt cutters on the wall that the maintenance guys aren't allowed to use, they have to be there, they're for an emergency. That is the emergency key. If you have an emergency, you can document why you needed to cut that lock. We'll give you a new lock and go about your business. But if you did it for uh, convenience sake, um, that's, that's a bigger problem. All right, so one keeper rule versus two keeper rule. Um, it it took, took some rewriting of the policies and that really went to the, uh, the animal care, the curatorial staff to, to figure out how to write that in to make that work. Um, and we needed to make that work without adding staff. And that, you know, that a lot of people, as soon as you say two keeper, oh, we don't have the staff for that. We don't have the staff for that. Um, and I, I like to think of it as, rather than you know, with a one keeper rule, it's kind of divide and conquer. Because what Palm Beach had was a, what they called, um, I think a modified two keeper rule. So there are two keepers had to be there uh, to open the building in the morning and make the initial shift of the cats and then they divide and conquer. So they go handle their other non-dangerous animals and 
and they will come back later in the day and uh, one of them would be assigned then to clean and then at the end of the day they'd get back together to put the pets where they belong for the night. Um, and I, I've, as I've gotten to know other zoos, that's very common. A lot of people, a lot of zoos have that kind of modified one keeper or two keeper rule where that's the case. Um, so to do a full on two keeper rule, the keepers have to work as a team. Teamwork makes it go faster. Um, so they get together in their routine, they get to these, the, the deadly animal buildings, they do the shifting, they can then leave and go do their uh, cleaning and they can separate and go do their non-deadly animal routines and then when it's time to come back and work in that building clean it up get it ready for the night they're both back there they work side by side they only open one room at a time and those are all administrative controls that make this work and the, the last bullet point on there um, it was it was strongly recommended by OSHA that we adopt the two keeper rule. They were really not comfortable with the fact that one person could be in that area, working that area by themselves. Um, Palm Beach Zoo was not cited for anything by OSHA, but they did, um, you know, the, in their letter, they did leave us with uh, quite a few recommendations, which is what a lot of this uh, is built on. Let me do my time. All right, so um, just to kind of recap, so implementing the two-key system of the two-keeper role, two keepers have to be present, working together, working as a team. And some of the protocols that are, are SOPs that back that up is, they also, the, the rule is you only open one den at a time. So you're going into clean den one, the two keepers have to be there, they open the top lock, they open the top, bottom lock, before that, they've confirmed that all shift doors are closed and locked. So the rules that the, the administrative supporting rule is all shift doors have to be closed and locked. You work in a team and you only enter one den at a time. When you're done, you walk out of that room, you relock the door, then you move on to the next one. I know that a lot of zoos for efficiency sake, they, they'll open a whole string of rooms at a time and they're in and out, in and out cleaning back and forth. Um, and you'll see, I think, in Tracy's presentation with a lockout tagout, that's very possible with this system. You do have to couple that then with a lockout tagout because you have multiple people, you have multiple occasions where you've cleared that room, you've done the right thing, but someone else could theoretically unlock and shift an animal in. So you have to prevent that. The, the administrative controls at Palm Beach Im implemented the two people are always working together. There's never more than one room open at a time. So that uh, alleviated the need for the lockout tagout on that system. So supporting administrative controls. I covered, I kind of already talked through a lot of this. I'll make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, another uh, important piece of this is the communication protocol. So the way that um, the animal care staff at Palm Beach wrote the protocol um, you have two keepers, uh, it doesn't, they, we went away from the primary and secondary titles that a lot, of, uh, a lot of institutions have, but one would have the duty of doing the shifting and the other is uh, kind of the eyes and ears. So the protocol would be if you're opening shift gate one, so if I'm the keeper, I say opening shift gate one, the other keeper has to repeat opening shift gate one. It's not just okay, it's not, it, what it takes away is that that immediate, okay, check, yep, done, check, yep, done. You have to say it back, you have to think it through, um, and just having that extra step, that helps work away at that complacency, because you have to think about what gate did they say, not just, okay, open the shift gate. Um, and one of the, the things that came out of the investigations with OSHA was that uh, some of the keepers, the, maybe the less experienced keepers were not necessarily comfortable as, you know, they're designated as secondary. They weren't as comfortable saying, well, I don't think that's the right way to do that, which is why OSHA um, recommended we kind of get rid of that classification of primary and secondary. Kind of everybody's equal. And then it's, it's what you see a lot in the safety world and emergency preparedness. You know, if you see something, say something. Uh, it doesn't matter who it is. It, it can be your boss. It can be the CEO. If they're doing something, in your animal area and you don't think it's safe, 
you you need to say something, you need to speak up. Um, and by kind of taking that classification out of the mix, that, that makes that a little bit easier. Um, it's important to document your key management policy, whatever you go with, um, because if something does go wrong after all of this, you, you need to have that documentation to protect yourself. The other thing that, uh, at the time of the incident, Palm Beach had a uh, pretty good system of training and tracking, and after the, after the incident, um, definitely improved that a lot. Um, the, the system before the incident was kind of a monthly shadowing and not necessarily a full reported documentation, but uh, it was regularly occurring. We were able to produce enough documentation um, that uh, OSHA, agreed that it was it was a safe policy and a safe program but they definitely recommended that we kind of step it up a notch um, so implement a plan where the training in the deadly animal areas was really a one-on-one -on -one with an experienced keeper hands-on a written test to make sure you understand it and then monthly testing um, and you'll see uh, a couple slides later the testing could have been um, by uh, physically shadowing or it can be done through video and then all of the training was logged and reported to the CEO uh, I believe on a monthly basis so some of the other administrative controls I'll go through really quickly that support the whole system and one of the things if you ever have an incident OSHA is going to tell you as an institution you are obligated to know that your staff is following your safety protocols all the time and that's really difficult to do. As I mentioned, Palm Beach had uh, a system where they would shadow monthly the keepers. So a keeper that's been trained and knows the right way to do things, when their boss shows up to shadow, they can go through the motions, they can follow all the rules, they can do things perfectly. The next day, if they've found a shortcut, they can follow it because they're smart enough to know the difference. And OSHA looks at it as, well, that's not okay. You have to have a way to know and their recommendation was uh, to put in a video camera system that covered the keeper areas. So many zoos have video cameras in all of their dens. They can see their animals all the time. But once you're outside the, the um, animal area, there's nothing on video. At Palm Beach, other than a, a couple uh, birthing dens, we didn't really have video cameras uh, anywhere at that time. So we went through and we put video cameras that could see the two locks on every door and could see every every shifting mechanism so that you're being recorded 24 7 not necessarily being watched these weren't monitored somewhere they're not somebody sitting there watching is everybody following the rules today but what that allows is the curatorial staff to pick a random day you don't know today Jeff you just got tested because I waited till you were all done and then I opened the video and I play it back um, and the side benefit that we discovered from that is it really increased um, self-reporting for the little things. And I know that uh, there's, there's a, a really good push going on for you know, increasing the self-reporting and the near misses. And what you'll have when you know you're in video and you know you did something wrong and it wasn't that big of a deal, that allows you to bring it up to your boss and then use it as a teaching moment, not a disciplinary moment. Um, so it really it did increase the self-reporting you know little things like you know yeah you, ha you have a sore knee and you have to bend down and pick something up and you're you're putting your hand on the wall <clears throat> right near the caging and uh, you don't realize until your boss is reviewing your your um, routine for the day that you, know, you were close enough that that tiger could have could have got your thumb you didn't realize you're doing it so you can take that um, you can learn from that, you can change your process, and um, it, it, it really helps. And the surprising thing, I was really expecting more pushback from this than the two key system, because you know, Big Brother's watching, <clears throat> and there was very little resistance to this, which, again, it was kind of surprising, but I think what it, it did, you know, people realized that we're just trying to make it safer, and they understood, um, kind of, this helps them hold themselves accountable. They don't have to be responsible to not cut the corner, not they not figure out that shortcut because they know they, they have to follow the rules. Um, 
gate control signage, this was a, a, a big thing for OSHA. They walked into this to do their investigation and you know, we had several different versions of signage. It could have been Sharpie written on the wall. Um, when you went through all the buildings, there was no consistency. They recommended consistent signage and color coding. Um, the, you know, the red versus green, it's, it's gonna be a discussion if you decide to do it because you know inherently red means stop and green means go. So if you look at these, the red say open. The red is stop. If that gate's open, you can't go in there. So it's in, the red is in the open position. When the gate is closed, it's green. Um, I have been in institutions where um, red means closed and green means open because that's for the animal. So animals can't, you know, and, and you have to think it through. You have to talk it through, and you have to just be consistent. Once, once you make a decision, which way to go, you do it throughout, and then you train that way, and uh, it's flexible. Uh, gate identification, you know, there was a lot of, or very little actually, at the actual gate location, what's the gate number? So when you're, you walk through with an OSHA person, they say, okay, this is you know G3, and it says G3 right on it, and they say, well, where's G3? You say, well, it's right there. And you, you know, for, from the outside looking in, there's no way to understand that. This is very helpful um, in training and uh, in explaining things to people, and then, Bedroom access sign. So Palm Beach calls uh, dens bedrooms, which took a while for me to get used to. I have not been to another zoo that calls them bedrooms, but uh, it, uh, it is where they sleep at night. So um, what OSHA wanted to see on the door, and this is more of uh, kind of a, a CYA thing. It helps for training and it helps for guests and if you have a maintenance worker coming in so they understand. Your keepers should be trained. You don't need to have a diagram to show them. You don't need to have a statement that says these doors have to be closed but for your maintenance worker that's going in they know the protocol all those gates have to be closed this is helpful for them. <coughs> so this is on every 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 den door what doors have to be closed and where the operators are um, that was uh, important and OSHA really uh, they really um, complimented us on the design of the sign um, Animal access signs, this was a big controversy. The way uh, Palm Beach Zoo <coughs> manages, if you have a den that animal has access to, there's a sign on it, and um, if the animal's in, it says animal access. If the animal's not in, it is blank. And the signs that we had at the time when this happened, if you slam the door too hard and the Velcro lets go, it defaults to blank. And this is literally the sign that was on the den, the den where the incident happened, and it was this, big controversy. So we redesi redesigned the signs. Um, the new sign is heavy duty, made of uh, stainless steel, stainless steel hinges, magnets to hold it up so it doesn't wear out. And if you slam the door too hard and it does open, it says animal has access, which is better to be safe and think the animal's in there than to think the animal's not. Again, this is an administrative control. You cannot, as a keeper, be relying simply on this sign. <coughs> Uh, and no keeper does, but it is uh, it is a backup and it's a support mechanism. Uh, color contrast was another. It was a simple one, and you can kind of see here a lot. A lot of the newer institutions have you know the version of the the white plastic door. Uh, I've built a lot of holding buildings over the years in the construction field. When you ask the animal staff, well, what color do you want? It? Well, we don't. We don't want it white because that gets too dirty. We don't want it dark because then it's too dark. So it's always some version of beige or, or tan, uh, which blends really well. Uh, what OSHA recommended is we, we need a color contrast. So out of the corner of your eye, you can see is that door open or closed. And we can see over on the side, it does make a big difference. And um, we didn't paint the whole building dark green. We just kind of, from here down, painted them dark green. Um, built up that color contrast. Little things can be done as a maintenance project. Um, some other little things, light switches on the outsides of the building, um, mirrors to cover blind spots, um, shields over door handles that doors could open. These are little supporting things that, that we implemented in each of our buildings. Um, pepper spray training. Um, a lot of institutions use the OC-10 or the Bear Spray. Uh, there's a few different brands out there. Um, the Counter Assault brand, they do sell test canisters. And if you have a program where you utilize that, I do highly recommend you get the test canisters, 
you run your team through firing them. It's just like fire extinguisher training. You can go through it a hundred times. There's nothing like pulling the pin <coughs> and squeezing that trigger to really see what it does. Um, it, it makes a big difference. Uh, we went to an annual training. So when onboarding a new keeper, you have to fire a canister. And then once a year you go, you retrain on that. <coughs> you need to make that muscle memory. I've, I've heard stories where um, the keeper's in a bad situation and they just totally forget they even have their pepper spray. You, you need to fire it. I think that just, that gives it that extra. You, you really know what you have in your hand then. Um, and Palm Beach at the time of the incident, the policy was you had to have the pepper spray on you when you went into the space, which means very often it's sitting on a counter uh, and you can forget and they just made the policy. You have to wear it all the time. Uh, if you're a keeper in one of these areas, when you uh, clock in in the morning, you put on your pepper spray and you take it off when you go home at night. Um, really quickly on costs. So the, the first number is a little deceiving because if you only do one building, that number is um, quite a bit higher. I, I divided that by um, a, a one fifth, which is probably a little bit lower than that, but it's been a couple years, so I round it up. Um, so for, for one building, $16,000, that's contracting everything, um, all the bells and whistles, everything you need to do to do it exactly the way Palm Beach, you did it. This number can be much lower. Don't let that number scare you. I know we want to talk about costs. We want to be transparent on costs, but that's kind of, if you want to do it, all the bells and whistles and don't do any work yourself, it's 16,000 per building. As you do more buildings, um, there's some efficiencies in there. The key watcher cabinets, as they get bigger, the incremental price is much smaller because you pay for the brain with your first cabinet and then you can have multiple cabinets as long as they're on the same uh, network. You can have multiple remote cabinets and the remote cabinets are much cheaper. Um, but this is really the average cost that we spent at Palm Beach. We did six buildings. Um, we went through and then as you approach this, um, and I know I'm out of time so I'm, I'm wrapping up, but as you approach this, don't think of, oh my gosh, I got to figure out my whole zoo at once. Pick a building, either your easiest building or your hardest building. Just pick a building, focus on that. How do I make it work on that? That's what we did. We took the Tiger building and where the incident happened. We made the system work. We learned some things along the way and then we rolled it out to the other buildings and it went very smoothly. So that's all I have. I think we're waiting till the end for questions. Or are we doing, yeah, we're yeah. waiting till the end for questions. So write them down. I know you guys got questions. But I also think some of what Tracy and Jeff will tell you might answer some of your questions. Uh, but, but write them down now. I'm, I'm here um, today and tomorrow, and we'll have my contact information for you guys as well. If you decide to go on this road, please, please reach out to me or Tracy or Jeff. We'll be happy to help you talk you through it. Um, I am a true, strong advocate for if you want to do this, there is a way to do it, and there's a way to do it in your budget. to talk to you a little bit about how we implemented the system at our zoo and probably more importantly why we implemented it. Um, so this was our overarching goal um, as to why we're doing it and it's to prevent our staff from unintentionally sharing space with a big cat or what we're referring to in this group, a potentially deadly animal. And so you'll probably see PDA a lot. Um, so, and the reason that we focused on big cats is because the data shows that if you are going to be killed in our profession, it's most likely going to be from unintentional contact with a big cat. And the numbers that you see up here are from a 10 year study that was done on human deaths in zoos. And those numbers on the left are from AZA and non-AZA zoos combined. And then the ones on the right are just AZA zoos. And you can see that in AZA zoos that about 43% of the deaths were caused by big cats. And I also have elephants and orcas up there. Um, and 
So you might ask why, you know, I'm even mentioning elephants and orcas since we focused on big cats. Um, but the reason is because of what was happening with elephants in the past, um, AZA did mandate some new standards for elephant management. And as of 2017, um, if you're an AZA facility holding elephants, then except in extreme circumstances or very special circumstances, you are not permitted to practice and restricted contact with elephants anymore. And that was to protect our staff. Um, and then also SeaWorld, it wasn't an AZA mandated change, but SeaWorld also adopted some new management strategies after their death that occurred in that 10 year period, um, where they no longer do the free swim with orcas. So in my mind, um, it's only a matter of time before AZA mandates the, this type of standard with big cats. Um, so why not get ahead of the curve and start putting it into practice now? And then um, this is a little bit about how we did it. We, we pretty much went off the, um, the protocol that Dave was just up here talking about. We have you know, a few differences, but we did host a mini safety summit in 2017. And we, from that safety summit, we identified what animals we were gonna focus on, which were the big cats. Um, Dave was there. Um, Dale from Denver Zoo was there. Um, there were members from the Felid tag and the bear tag and um, a couple other places. And with Dave on grounds, we started conducting uh, safety inspections of our big cat area. So he helped us identify uh, things that he recommended we put into place and, and changed. Um, and then we met with our staff, uh, our curators and the keepers who work with these animals. And they were all on board with these changes and making things safer. Uh, we got with our maintenance department and they made the necessary modifications um, anywhere that we didn't currently have places for two locks. They um, added what we needed to be able to put two locks there. And then we also purchased our equipment, which were our locks, our bolt cutters, <laughs> our mirrors, um, and some other items. Um, and I should mention that we already had a lockout tag out um, policy in place. We have for, for years. Um, so that was already part of our practice. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we also created job ha hazard analysis and we used the format that you can find on OSHA's website. Um, we wrote new safety protocols for these areas and we've developed staff training checklists and I brought examples <coughs> of pr some protocols and some checklists if anybody wants to see those or make copies of them or I can send them to you. Um, and then we got our staff qualified under these new protocols and um, started putting it into practice. And initially we thought we're gonna do all of our big cat areas at the same time. Um, but then we thought that could be a little overwhelming. So we decided to start with one building at a time. So we started with tigers. Uh, we did tigers in January. In February, we did our leopards. This month, our mountain lions. And in April, we'll be finishing up with African lions. And these are our locks that we got. And um, they come in silver. And so we wanted them color coded. So we bought this fancy two inch colored duct tape and just put a strip around the locks to identify. So these are all cored differently. So that's a little different uh, from Dave's system too, where he has the keys that'll work in different locks. Um, each of these locks takes a different key. Um, so the blue and yellow are the ones we use on our uh, gates and doors. And then the red locks were the locks that we had in place already. Um, so those are our locks that we use on our secondary containment and shift doors. And then the green lock is a manager lock. Um, and I'll 
tell you a little bit about that too. And then we adopted the same key cabinet system um, as Dave in the Palm Beach Zoo. Um, so he already talked to you about this, so I don't need to do that. But the, oh, this is, um, for me, the, you know, the entire protocol obviously is really important, but for me, these are the five key pieces that I feel are most important. Um, so having a version of a lockout tagout system, and what I mean by a version is like we don't actually use the tag part of the system. So we've started calling it a lockout system because we don't <coughs> use the tag. Um, and then having those two differently keyed locks on each uh, big cat primary <coughs> containment door and gate is obviously key. Um, and then adopting a sterile cockpit uh, policy, which I'll tell you about. The two-way communication system is very important. And then of course the training your staff on the protocols and getting them through the, the ch training checklist. So the lockout tag, this is just the definition of lockout tagout. Um, and in our industry, I think the important piece there is um, safeguarding employees from the release of hazardous energy um, during the servicing and maintenance of your enclosures. And in our facilities, um, this is what hazardous energy looks like. <coughs> So this is our tiger building. Um, all of the yellow areas are where a tiger could potentially be. Uh, the white areas are keeper spaces. Um, so and all the shift doors are the little red lines you see there. So, so this is how a lockout system works. So you see there where the keepers are in their cleaning stalls. Um, if in this scenario there's still a tiger in the building and there's a tiger out in the main exhibit and where those stars are are where you would put these devices and you can see the pictures at the bottom. We also brought examples up here that are on the table of um, the lockout tagout devices and the little locks and things. So if these three shift doors are locked out then there's no way a keeper can shift a cat in on you. So anybody who's working in that building, so if there's four people in there, then there would be four different little locks on these devices. Um, so even if somebody left and took their lock, you still wouldn't be able to shift a cat onto them because it still has three different locks on it. And then another, just another example, both cats are outside. Um, this is the last, where that star is, is the last shift door uh, that every cat has to come through to enter the building. So that's where you would put your device. I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it. I mean, if you were to totally leave the building, you could even, there, we're not showing the gate at the, there's a gate between the kitchen and that bat keeper hallway that isn't shown on there because it's secondary containment, but you could even just lock out that gate and then nobody could go back there. And these are just some examples around the zoo. This is actually in our grade eight building because we don't just use lockout tag out in big cats. We use it in most areas of our zoo. Um, so the, uh, the gold lock in that one picture is a keeper lock. And then the device is through the same pole in this picture. And then the little tiny locks are the ones that individual uh, staff members have who are working in that area. <coughs> so you can see they can't open that door even if they took the keeper lock off. And the other one is just showing the device itself through the hole with the red keeper lock on there and the two lockout keys. Um, and then some doors have multiple holes so you could do it that way as well. And that upper um, picture 
is an example of a modification that our maintenance department made so that we could use a lockout device because we weren't able to in that spot right there that's on a, a grade 8 shift door. And then with the two locks and with the two different keys, um, just an example of a gate that's secured properly. And when they're color coded like this, it doesn't really matter where the locks end up. They can be, you know, moved around as long as there's one of each color on there. And, and the second picture here is just an example. If we're, when we're cleaning a stall, we have another space where the locks go <clears throat> that's away from the gate so that you can never like look and think, oh, that it's locked or it's false lock, you know, heard that keepers false locking things. So, so this prevents that from happening, actually removing the keys away from the gate. And this is an example of a manager lock. You can see the little green lock in the upper right hand corner. This is um, a transport chute for our mountain lions, but they actually use it to shift in and out of the building every day. But when we need to transport one up to the vet clinic, they go in there, they get hand injected. Um, and once they're down, we remove this and it gets brought up to the vet clinic. And that rarely happens. So that's why there's a manager lock on there. So, so it's meant for, I think we have a total of five manager locks. So it's not very many around the zoo. Um, so it's just used in places where we rarely use those doors, um, where I think that could be an area that a mistake could happen if it, if it wasn't a manager lock situation, um, that the keepers aren't used to using these doors. Um, so it could, you know, potentially get forgotten because they don't ever use it and you could make a mistake there. So another example is, um, in our tiger hallway at the end of their shift there's a guillotine door that opens all the way up and it's only used for crate training if we're going to transport an animal so it rarely gets used that has a manager lock on it um, and then this is the sterile cockpit policy if you haven't heard of it but um, basically crew members aren't allowed to be, be chatting when they're operating the airplane. Um, so, you know, you can chat all you want as you're approaching the building, but once inside the building, it becomes the sterile cockpit and you're not talking about what you're doing for lunch that day or what you did over your weekend or venting about something. Um, you're just focused on what you're there to do. You know, you have a brief discussion about what you're going in there to do, if it's shifting, if it's cleaning, whatever it is, you, you know what each other's doing. Um, and then you go ahead and do it without any idle chatter. And then I really think the two-way communication is extremely important. Um, especially based on a personal experience we had at our zoo many years ago, um, where a keeper, we don't even have this area anymore, but a keeper was you know, in the back area, um, getting ready to shift some cats, some young juvenile mountain lions, and another keeper was still in the exhibit space. And apparently the keeper in the back said, she, she was getting ready to shift cats. The keeper up front didn't hear what she said and said okay or something. And so the doors opened, the cats came out at one end and the keeper saw them and she was able to just leave the area and lock it up. But that to me is like, you know, a it was really eye-opening that you can't just say okay and think you heard what you didn't hear. Um, so like Dave said, repeating back exactly what you heard so that the other person knows you heard exact or they heard exactly what you said. Very important. Um, 
So what are you waiting for? Why aren't you doing this? Um, when we asked that question, I feel like the two most common things that we heard was money and resistance, um, staff resistance. Um, so here's what it costs us to do this at our facility. And so all the modifications that we made, purchasing the locks, um, the bolt cutters, the mirrors, all of that was less than $10,000. And then purchasing the key watcher cabinet, uh, that was less than, it was just under $15,000. Um, and then, you know, of course, you can't put a price on having peace of mind and being able to sleep at night. Um, but if you still think that's, you know, maybe a little rich for you, there are other ways to do a key security system, like Dave mentioned, and this is how we started. So before we had our cabinet, um, we just had a locked box with our deadly animal keys in it, with a sign out sheet, and a manager, the manager of the day was responsible for um, signing these keys out to staff and then signing them back in at the end of the day. So simple systems like this can definitely work as well. And I would ask if you can afford this. So grief counselors, hate mail, animal rights extremists coming after you, um, police, OSHA, USDA, and AZA investigations, lawsuits, high staff turnover, um, and loss of trust um, from your community and your staff, because that's what happens when these tragedies occur. And prevention works. I mean, I think we all know it. I mean, who doesn't have a preventative health program at their zoo? or a preventative maintenance program for your car. Um, so prevention really works. Um, and go, getting back to why, uh, why we're doing it and why I'm a big advocate for it, I have a series of six slides that, um, I'm, I'm gonna let you read the quotes on these slides. They're from our <laughs> staff. Um, staff who work with these animals and how they feel um, about this program and <clears throat> when I first put these slides together I had photos of the person like I had a photo of Amy working with an African lion um, and then as as I went through I thought <coughs> you know it's so, it's so much more than that I mean these People don't, they're, they're not just employees that work at our zoo for eight hours a day. I mean, they have, Amy has a, a boyfriend and, you know, dogs, she loves hiking, she has a, a family, you know, these are, these are real people who have hopes and dreams of lives outside of our work. Um, so that was really my message is to think of them that way, and that they're, they're, they're worth every penny you spend on this. Diana, that's her on her wedding day recently. with her husband and their twin boys.
Rebecca's husband. And this is a, a kind of funny quote from Basha. She's the one in the middle. Her dad said this. And then this is Ed, he's one of the members of our firearms team, and he had this to say. Thanks for your time, and I just want to thank all of these people. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we implemented at Henry Vilasu. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the cultural piece of this. Um, so we're going to talk about um, after Palm Beach had their incident, what we did, because that really was the inception um, of this uh, uh, for us. So we're going to talk about post-incident next steps, uh, the implementation without locks, which was really important for our facility, um, then some facilities modifications. Uh, implement and then the implementation of two locks and then I have a little quick quiz for you so I hope that you guys all take it at the end um, you won't have to turn in a paper so don't worry about that um, so after the incident at Palm Beach uh, there was a lot of media that was coming out um, and so we sat with our keepers and our management staff and just said look these people are doing everything right like when when the their director reported out on it they were doing everything that everybody was doing and it still happened um, and I uh, worked cats as a one keeper um, I've worked cats as a two keeper and if you would ask me at that time I would say that I felt safer with a one keeper rule and this was my reason my reason was if I make a mistake I'm the one that gets killed but our industry can't take that and what happened to Palm Beach Zoo um, was bigger than just one person's incident it was to an entire, um, it was into the entire zoo and it was to the entire community and it was into the entire AZA community. And we can't have that be our answer. And so I'm embarrassed to have said that that is my answer, that as a keeper, I was like, well, it was only me that gets hurt, but that's not the truth of these situations. They're way bigger than one person or one animal. So when we had the conversations, we said, well, let's risk assess what our biggest issue is and that was putting cats into the exhibit. And the risk assessment for that looked like we put a cat in the exhibit and if one of our exterior doors is open, then a cat is uh, going to escape. The cat's gonna escape onto the uh, zoo. We're gonna pull firearms, then um, we may or may not end up discharging a firearm. Well, that seems really unsafe. So our very first step was to um, have managers go down and check the exhibit security before we let cats out in the yard. And the keepers were really opposed to that. They're like, why are you checking up on us? We don't wanna do this radio call. Everybody knows when we're putting our animals out. Um, and so I said, well, let's just test it for a month. And if we don't like it, it doesn't fit for our institution, then let's revisit it. And after that month, they were like, we're really glad that you're coming down. And we feel like we have support from the management. And we feel like you guys know what's going on in our operation. So the unintended consequence of implementing this policy that they didn't want us in to implement was they felt better, they felt safe. Um, so after that, then we um, looked at other things that we could implement. Um, and I was lucky, um, I uh, visit Florida um, a couple of times a year to do sea turtle conservation. And after Dave presented last year, I said, for the first time, I think somebody has figured it out for us. I thought that it was, I, you know, I've heard one keeper rule, two keeper rule, 
which one's safer and you know we could go back and forth all day long and for the very first time i heard somebody present on something that i felt like that one thing would have saved that person's life and if you're in if you're in any of your roles um, but especially if you're in my role or a director role the last thing we want to do is have that conversation with somebody's family and so every day that every day that i work i say what do i not want to be on a witness stand for and what do i not want to tell somebody's family those are two litmus tests that i use to to say is this worth doing and this is definitely worth doing so communication is the key it really is so um after i came back from palm beach zoo i sat down with my staff and i said hey i want to share this experience that i just had right because they did not get to witness the same experience that i had they didn't see the locks in place they didn't hear the stories that um that jan uh told us when she walked around and i said i just want to tell you the story of what happened to me while i was on this trip so i shared with that them with them the story of all of the things that i've seen and how i wanted to make it safe and i said i want you guys to go home every day i want you to feel like you're safe and they all bought into it i just i said this is what i saw what do you guys think and they're like we should do that okay great because one of the one of the issues that we hear is that that staff is resistant and um, i think it's it, it's incumbent on us to set up that experience for them so that they can kind of go through the same journey that we go through that we've been on for maybe a year um, and then we say hey i got this great idea i want to roll it out to you and they're like no 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 i don't want to do that we have to give them that experience and give that that them the time to come to it so um i'll go through this quickly Silver is dangerous animal, so prior to implementation, if you were able to work a dangerous animal, you had a silver uh, lock key, and you could go anywhere that there was a dangerous animal. Red is a, uh, the red master is down here. It's a single lock key, uh, so like a lockout, tag out key. Um, yellow keys are cat keepers, and uh, blue keys are, uh, are blue uh, manager cat keys. We implemented a little bit different, and that's what I'm going to kind of highlight here today. Um, sorry, so uh, one more thing on the communication is the key. We were not ready to implement with actual locks, but we felt like the safety procedures were something that we could implement. So we actually started by pretending. Um, so we would go down and we would, a manager would go down and have the conversation I think this is a cat space. I think this is a keeper space. And you're gonna see that a little bit um, as it plays out in a very, very rough and ready um, animation uh, towards the end, but that I thought kind of helped talk us through the process. But before we ever implemented, we decided that we were gonna try it. And that's what I'm really here to encourage you to do is, if you're like, this doesn't work for my institution, then I would say, then test it because if you test it and it doesn't, then at least you've tested it. And if you just leave here saying, it doesn't work for my institution and you don't test it, I'm not sure that you can really say that or that you really know. It was a lot easier. And for us, it built this very, very strong communication component to it um, that I thought was uh, really important that uh, still is going on today. The next thing that we hear that I'd like to dispel is, well, this is expensive. It's onerous on the institution. There's no way that I, I know, I, my institution doesn't have a lot of money. How am I going to be able to solve that? Um, and it took me a little while, I'll be honest with you, to, to solve it because I was like, oh, and we looked at three or four different iterations. Um, but basically we have guillotines and we have um, a ring here and the locks go on the ring so you can't pull the ring down. It was a pretty easy facilities modification. And this is again our older facilities and hope to get rid of this very soon. Um, we had old jail cell doors and the jail cell doors, when you uh, move the lever, one pin goes down, one pin goes up and it locks it. It was super easy. We drilled another hole. It didn't cost us anything and put another lock on that. So um, it takes uh, two people to go through that. And again, I'll show you that in a minute. And in some of our newer facilities, we were already designed to do this. So implementation, 
from a facility standpoint, didn't take anything. So we have a shift door here that has a mesh door and then a shift door here that has a plastic door. Um, and so we just double locked those and so a cat can't go from one stall to another without two people's agreement. All right, here we go. This, I'm gonna stand back here so that I can actually see it and read. So this is the way a cat um, exhibit might look in the morning during cat check. So right now we have the exhibit that's up on the right, it's green. We have the cat that's in uh, stall one, two, and three. Um, and this is the way you might uh, find it in the morning. And I wanna make sure that I'm clear the, the, a little bit of the where we get our uh, system is from um, a system called Ride Access Control. Um, I learned it at Disney uh, when I was doing some operations stuff. And basically it's the handoff of a space between um, a dangerous element um, and a non-dangerous <coughs> element. So our dangerous our element in this is a tiger. Um, and so um, one previous thing is I want to talk a little bit about muscle memory. There's many days when I wake up in the morning, I put my clothes on, um, I go to work, I show up at work. I don't really remember my ride there. That's probably for the better. Um, and then sometimes I'll get up on Sunday, I'll put my clothes on and you know, I'm going to breakfast and you know what, lo and behold, I end up at work. Um, and then I have to you know, figure out how I'm going to get from work to wherever I was really supposed to go. And that is the moment that we're working towards solving here, right? Keepers are opening locks thousands or millions of times in their career, and they have this muscle memory of doing it the same way that I end up um, at work instead of breakfast is the same way that a keeper makes a mistake. Um, and we can't, we can't rely on uh, somebody else fixing that mistake. So in a two keeper system, you say, well, you know, there's somebody else there to catch that mistake. If they're not doing dishes, if they're not uh, busy doing something else, and if we don't take a shortcut, so we can't really rely on that. So, um, so this system kind of helps us with that. All right, so here we go. So we have a manager and a keeper, and this is getting ready to shift a cat um, onto exhibit. And so we call this the handoff of the keeper space to a cat space and the keeper and the manager are gonna check the exhibit, make sure it's secure. It has a yellow lock and a blue lock on it. And then they have a conversation. And this conversation, I think is the key, is one of the keys to it being successful. So one of them says, I think that this is a cat space and here's why. We have all these locks. And the other person says, I agree, that is uh, definitely a cat space, we have it all secure. <laughs> and as soon as they have that conversation, the exhibit is a cat space. That still doesn't mean that that cat can be shifted there because there are two locks on this, um, on this transfer door right here. So instead of lock out, tag out for a transfer door in our situation, we lock them out um, blue and yellow. So after they've made this agreement, each one of them is going to remove their lock and shift the cat. Wow. All right, thank you. That was really difficult. Um, so, that, so they have that agreement. Well, at this point, stall one, two, three, and the exhibit are all cat spaces. Nothing has happened. Um, it is still a cat space. So if I wanted to, I could shift that animal back, um, back and forth all day long. It's all a cat space. Keeper puts their lock back on, manager puts their lock back on, then they're going to go and they're going to get, they have their positive count of the cats, they know where their cat is, they're gonna check their stalls visually to make sure that there are no cats in there, and then they're going to have a conversation. I think that it's safe to enter the stalls, and here's why, I think that there's a lock that locks the cat out from the exhibit, and there's no cats visible in the stall. I know where my one cat is. You probably have more than one cat, but I know where all of my cats are. I think that it's safe to enter that stall. The manager agrees with that. It then becomes a keeper space. So we've defined a keeper space versus the um, cat space now. 
the manager removed the locks and it is now a keeper space. See a manager. The manager leaves. Nothing can happen. Um, that cat can't come back in the building for any reason. Um, there's no safety uh, uh, issue there. The cat is all locked out. The keeper removes their locks, does all of their fancy cleaning that they're asked to do. <laughs> and then when they're done cleaning, they're gonna go ahead and re-secure the space with their yellow locks, saying that it, saying that it's secure. So at this point, um, maybe it's 10 o'clock in the morning, they're done cleaning. Um, they need to go back in and put enrichment. They can go back in and put enrichment. They can lock it back up, go to lunch. They can do whatever they want. That space is a keeper space. They can do it all day long. They could do it all year long. It's going to always be a keeper space until it is turned back over to a cat space. <clears throat> so the keeper says, all right, well, I'm done cleaning for the day. I've put all my enrichment in there. I can feed through the feed chutes. I've done everything that I want to do. I'm going to call <coughs> my manager. My manager's going to do a lock check with me. We have that ever important conversation that says, I think that this is a cat space. And I, they agree. <coughs> to secure the, the facility. And now it is a cat space again, just like it was when they shipped it out. Manager then at that point can remove that lock from the shift door because that locks uh, their lock's purpose is, is over and they can leave. Now it's all a cat space, so our keeper can remove that lock, they can ship that cat from outside to inside, inside to outside, <clears throat> they can shift from stall one, stall two, and stall three. Get shipped back outside, come back in. You get the point? It's all a cat space. And so wherever that cat ends up is um, is fine. Um, it's all a cat space. You see that I put silver locks in between. So when we define a cat space, the, it is truly a conversation of where we're going to lock a cat out. If we had multiple cats in the building, um, we could lock out stall three and stall one and access stall two. Um, it's, we have blue and yellow locks on all of the spaces. Um, we wanted to make sure that we gave the flexibility that we could define a cat space um, and still deal with weather events. So put a cat out on exhibit and we have an afternoon thunderstorm or off exhibit holding, uh, which is a lot more secure than the exhibit. Um, is a cat space during the day, and so anybody who is a dangerous animal person can move that cat into off exhibit holding. If the building was already cleaned and we had removed the lock for the building, then we would be able to um, pull that cat all the way in the building. So we can do, we can shift in any cat space at any time, uh, which gives the flexibility of dealing with, um, you know, kind of a, a natural event that comes up, like a tornado watch which we get a lot of, or any other kind of weather event that um, might happen. All right, so then our keeper puts the lock back on and we're done. So <coughs> I guess, here's our quiz part, um, is what is it gonna take you to try, just to try? I'm not saying that you have to implement, though I'd really love for you to, but what is it gonna take for you to try? Is it gonna take an incident at your institution? That's not what any of us want. Is it gonna take an act of courage to be that one lone wolf who says, I'm going to make a difference uh, even if everyone hates it? Um, is it gonna take money? Because I don't think that money, um, I think that we've kind of tried to dispel that. It took us about $4,400 to implement uh, our locks and that was the cost of the locks and the very few facilities modifications we had to do. And, um, um, and we're gonna get a key watcher right now. Uh, all of our managers have blue locks, all of our keepers have yellow locks. I'll tell you the unintended consequence of going that way is that um, every day I make a decision and it's never on safety. We're always doing our safety procedures 
I make a decision, am I going to continue this meeting that I'm going, that I'm in right now, or am I going to put cats out late? That is the decision that I make. It's never around safety. Safety is not an option that we ever um, talk about. It's, I'm in a meeting and there's a cat check, there's nobody else can do it. Hey, I need to have cats out at 9.30. I'm gonna have to stop this meeting and go do that, or I'm going to decide to put a cat out later. Um, but it's never on safety that we're, that we're looking at making that decision. The other unintended consequence of it is, you know what, I know what's going on in my dangerous animal areas. In my most dangerous animal areas, our managers know uh, what is going on. And your managers probably know what's going on too, um, but we're forced to go down um, and do that. And if you're uh, a deputy director um, and you get to leave a meeting to go and do a cat check, I'm telling you, that's a huge win. So, <laughs> so um, there are very few negatives to implementing this and a ton of positives. So I just, um, the, our last one is, uh, do you need to have a compelling story from three institutions that have implemented? Because I hope that we've delivered on that today. Um, so at the end, I just want you to go and try, even if it's just the verbal part, just try it because I think that you'll find that um, it's a really great way to implement uh, something that will uh, make your keepers feel better, make your managers feel better, and know that every day that you can go home and rest a little bit.